Hello everyone, my name is Doug Bassett. I'm the Senior Technical Instructor for the Microsoft side of Stormwind Epic Live. And today I'm going to do something a little unusual. I'm going to dive in and show you some things that I really haven't had much of a chance to play with. I call this the geeking out first look. Now, what is it that has me so excited? Well, it's Windows 8. Uh, Windows 8, you can get a developer copy for free from Microsoft. They have a 32-bit and a 64-bit. And if you are not quite sure which one you have, look at what your current operating system is. And if it's 64-bit, download 64 if you want to do that. What I'm doing is I'm running this inside of a virtual machine. And it's really pretty simple as long as you pull down the right version. If you're using Hyper-V on Windows 2008 R2 or something along those lines, you're going to want to grab the 64-bit version. And it's actually a pretty simple installation. All that you do is you pull down the ISO. You just simply say, hey, I want to boot from the ISO, and it goes ahead and does the installation for you. The installation is fairly straightforward. There's really not a lot of questions besides the name of your computer, and it'll ask you, hey, do you want to turn on all these automatic settings, and so on and so on. But probably the biggest difference that we have with Windows 8 is the interface. If you look at this interface, the first thing that I think is it looks like an iPad. I mean, it really does. You go down here and you slide stuff around and you can drag icons back and forth into different locations. It sort of does sort of an auto sort thing for you. And if anything, it reminds me of an Apple iPad. I mean, I can have different windows that I slide around in. If I want to, I can put this into what I call Twitch version, where it sits there and shakes, and you can move the various uh, icons around. So it looks a lot like Apple. Um, a lot of the demos that we've seen, for example, up at YouTube, things like that, they actually have a touch screen. Well, this is more of a desktop operation, because I don't know about you, but my boss hasn't coughed the money yet for a nice touch screen uh, TV. So Tom, if you're listening, maybe this would be an interesting time to do this. Uh, I have this installed on a virtual machine. Um, you just have to make sure you get the right version, 32-bit if you have a 32-bit virtual machine, or 64-bit if you're running something like 2008 R2, and it runs surprisingly well. So let's go ahead and geek out a little bit. And again, I haven't really practiced all these demos and tried all this stuff and tried all that stuff. You're geeking out with me, so it's going to be uh, pretty cool. Uh, you notice that we have a variety of icons. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller. Uh, you don't have a start menu down here at the bottom, which is kind of weird. Now, of course, if you want to go to a nor, nor, uh, more common desktop, you can click the desktop icon, or you can just type desktop, and it'll go ahead and bring you right there. Oh, there's our little start button. If I go down and hit the start button, look what happens. It goes back into our environment here. But one of the interesting things, and this is something that I find is incredibly cool, is a search interface. If you're familiar with uh, Windows 7 or 2008 R2, the search interface on those, it's pretty spectacular. You have it right above the start menu. You can just type the command. It'll automatically go out and do all the searching. But here, they've eliminated one of the steps, which is kind of cool. So for example, let's say, even though I know the icon's right there, let's say I want to bring up the control panel. I can go in here and I can say C-O-N-T-R-O-L. And as soon as I start typing, it finds the applications right there that have that particular name. So it makes it very, very easy for me to locate uh, applications or files or, or whatever it is I'm looking on my particular system. So let's go ahead and go old school. Let's say that I want to, uh, to really go in and just find some various applications. They go in and they put this in alphabetical order so you can locate them like that. And if I need to, I can move over and uh, you know fire the thing off if that's what I want to do. They have PowerShell built right in, Explore, Easy Transfer Wizard, I mean, just a lot of basic apps that you have. Now, again, this is sort of a preview version. So what you see here may not necessarily be what you see uh, in your version when you pull it down, because Microsoft fully has the ability to change things anytime that they want. So if I want to, I can go into my desktop here. And let's say that I want to um, you know, go out and uh, browse my computer. I can go in and open up my libraries, my normal document stuff that we have. One of the things that we're starting to see with Microsoft operating systems is they're all about this Microsoft Office type ribbon. Everything is ribboned. And as you go through, the ribbon is going to change in context. Now, some people love the Office 2010 ribbon. Um, some people don't. I'm not all that comfortable with it yet, even though we're seeing it in products like SharePoint and things like that. I like having the icons or I like having the options, having a 
uh, dynamic ribbon up here sometimes is a little bit of a challenge simply because I'm not used to it. So uh, let's go ahead and go back to the desktop. Now let's say that I want to make some modifications. I'm going to go in, I'm going to start typing, C-O-N-T-R-O-L. Oh, look what happens. When you're at the desktop, that automatic typing and bring stuff up that everything flies out, it's not necessarily going to do that for you. So what you would need to do is, again, go back into here and you can just hit Control Panel. Or you could uh, fire off a more normal Control Panel if that's what you want to do. So here's our Control Panel that we have. And one of the things that you're going to see during the installation is a really big on these slider things. For example, notifications. And again, we'll go back to my uh, ever loving iPad here. And anytime that you have your iPad up and running, if you get a Twitter notification or a news notification, it'll pop right up on your screen. Well, you have that opportunity here on your lock screen where you can say, hey, do I want notifications? Do I want to have notification sounds? And it's a lock. It's not a checkbox. It's sort of a little slider thing that goes across. And this is also the configuration options that we see when you install the operating system. So Microsoft is getting kind of an interesting look and feel. Now, there's a lot of different things in here. And again, I haven't played with a whole bunch. But let me just show you some of the interesting things. For example, personalize. One of the things that they, allows you to, that they allow you to do is to change how you do your logons. You don't necessarily have to type in a password or anything. You can go in and select a picture and then modify how you log in with uh, sort of a touch screen if you have the touch screen interface. Um, since I don't have a touch screen interface, again, it's more of a normal configuration. Here's our user settings, not really a whole lot. You can log on with a Windows Live ID or you can use a local password. Uh, are you going to do wireless mode? Here again is our notification. You can go in and set it up application by application. Privacy. Here's something that I'm not entirely sure I'm 100% comfortable with. Microsoft is making it so that when you have applications, these applications can use your personal information like your location, the, uh, your web history, stuff like that, to provide you more personalized content. And again, I'm not entirely sure I'm comfortable with that, but in the logon screen, you can turn all that stuff off because allowing applications to have that level of access is on by default. If you're a little security paranoid like I am, maybe this is something that you'll want to disable. Here's things like your time zones that you can set. Do you want to do a touch keypad? Uh, this is kind of interesting. Refresh your PC without affecting your files. I mean, think about it. You go through and you get a nasty virus or something on your machine and it's tearing everything up. Um, you would go in and you'd have a restore point and you would roll it back and it would change this and it would change that. But you can actually refresh your PC with Windows, uh, Windows uh, 8 and what it'll do is it'll set your application settings back to the defaults. If you have applications that were already installed on there, those applications will no longer be installed. So it can be kind of a a scary system, but you can say, hey, I want to refresh it. You're not going to lose your photos and your videos and your personal files. Or if you want to, let's say that you're going to donate your machine. It'll clean all of your applications and your files off of there. So you can sit there and say, hey, I want to reset my machine so I can give it to my uncle or my cousin or my brother or something like that. Because we're starting to see where computers are good for more than a couple of years. I mean, we have such big processors and such hordes of RAM the old setting where you would have to go in and upgrade your machine every couple of years, that's kind of fallen by the wayside unless you're ch uh, chasing video games. So you can have machines that can be multi-generational. I've My brother, he gives his laptops to his kids, who gives it to their kids, and so on and so on. And these older machines still, still run really well. Like I said, this is in a, a virtual machine. I've given it two gigs of RAM, but I don't have high-end video cards or anything like that set up in here and yet it seems to run you know, fairly well. Um, they can go through and they can identify devices. The big thing with devices, here's all my little machines and all this, the big thing that you can do with devices is that you can actually add devices that are on other machines. For example, I have a printer. This allows me to hook up to it and I can download printer device drivers automatically. And they're really big about that home networking where you can share information back and forth. And that's where we get into the home group. You can go through and you can say, I want to share music or pictures or videos or printers or other devices. And the neat thing is, is that you can have a password. Now, we've seen Home Group before in Windows 7, but they really make it a lot easier in, uh, to, in Windows 8 to be able to set all this stuff up. 
You can have Windows Update, which is a big thing. In fact, um, when you first log in and you first set this thing up, your Windows Update is turned on by default, and that means that you're going to go through and automatically download updates and service packs and all that. One of the problems that we've seen with people trying to install this operating system is that they will try and put a 32-bit copy of Windows 8 on a 64-bit machine, or they will try and put it on a virtual machine that is 64-bit. And the problem with that is, is that it doesn't get the right device drivers. So if you are going to put this in a virtual machine, or maybe you have a, a laptop or a desktop or something that's hanging out, you want to try a new operating system, you can go through and install it. But try and match 64-bit to 64-bit and 32-bit to 32-bit. A lot of the reports that we've had of people having difficulty was because it doesn't get the right device drivers. Now these are kind of the general settings that we have. We can also go in and do a lot more settings. And this is where we get into our normal control panel that we know and love from Windows 7. And it's very, very familiar. Go in and look at my setup and security, back up my data, find problems, uh, network status, appearance and personalization, create user accounts, all of that. So there's a lot of stuff under the covers that are very, very similar. For example, if I want to go in and I want to change appearance and personalization, now we have different options like different themes or backgrounds, change our display text. Here's something else we have, desktop gadgets. Now, one of the things you may have noticed if I go down here, we have different commands that we're able to bring up. We have the ability to bring some of these things up, which is kind of neat. Um, over on the right-hand side, you'll get what are called charms. And again, I haven't played with this operating system enough to really understand how the charm thing works, but uh, you're able to have applications that'll pop out a charm, and then you can configure these applications so that searching is relevant just to that particular app, or, or you can uh, expose your searching to applications and all that. Um, folder options, this is I can do single or double click, I can show hidden files, easy access keys, uh, that's ease of access center, we have taskbar customization. Um, there's just tons and tons of things that we can do in here. But if you are familiar with Windows 7, uh, a lot of these things are going to be fairly similar to what you're already used to. Probably the biggest thing to get used to is the, the new interface, being able to go through and make changes and run your various applications and, and all of that. Now, again, this is a developer's copy. That means that it's going to have certain things that may not be there in the final version. But uh, it's kind of a neat operating system. I haven't played with it a whole lot, but I'm looking forward to it. So uh, keep your eyes open at this space. I'm sure that uh, sooner or later we're going to have uh, Windows 8 class to fill out our, uh, our corral of all the Microsoft courses for MCITP. And I'm really looking forward to, to, to digging into this and really bringing some uh, interesting changes uh, to the forefront for our students. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for your attendance, and uh, hopefully you found this to be somewhat informative.